The internet is an interesting place. It's loaded with games, obscure forums, fights, discussions, chaos. Well, we know it. Of course, there's some mysteries, and that's the part that intrigues me the most. There's the creepy ones like I Am God, Erratus, and countless others. And there's one in particular that piqued my interest when I first saw it, because it opens up a range of other subjects. It all starts in July 2010. It's the golden age of YouTube. Content creators are on the rise, memes are becoming ever so popular, and in a philosophy-focused forum called Less Wrong, user Roko made a post called Public Choice and the Altruist Burden. It basically presents the problem with him being an altruist and making big contributions to charity. The post is around a 5 minute read. All sources are in the description if you're interested, but to summarize, the problem with charity, and especially efficient charity, is that the incentives for people to contribute to it are all messed up. You harm a concentrated interest, friends, potential partners, children, in order to reward a diffuse interest, helping each of billions of people by a tiny amount. The concentrated interest then retaliates, because by standard public choice theory it has an incentive to do so, but the diffuse interest just ignores you. Concretely, your friends think that you're weird, and potential partners may refrain from involvement with you. People in general may perceive you as being of lower status, both because of your reduced ability to signal status via conspicuous consumption if you give a lot of your money away, and because of the weirdness associated with the most efficient charities. This is the altruist burden. The post then goes a long way explaining the subject and presenting evidence. It sparked a lot of attention, and Broco soon made another post with solutions to this problem, and other examples. The first part goes like this. One way to overcome the altruist burden problem is to stop being an altruist, to reframe your impulses to help this and others as a bias rather than a preference. In the case of existential risks, there are additional reasons for doing this. Firstly, that the people who are helping you are the same as the people who are punishing you, this is not the case for aid to the developing world. This is not an option that I personally like. Another perfectly valid reaction is to just take the hit and accept that you will be taken advantage of as an altruist, but that it is worth it. This is also not an option that I personally like. In this vein, there is the ominous possibility that, if a positive singularity does occur, the resultant singleton may have been pre-committed to punish all potential donors who knew about the existential risks but who didn't give 100% of their disposable incomes to X-Risk motivation. This would act as an incentive to get people to donate more to reduce the existential risk and thereby increase the chances of a positive singularity. The post goes on with solutions to this specific scenario and hypothetical tricks to overcome the problem. But this specific part started a big talk in the forum. Even the creator of the entire site commented on this post calling it stupid and possibly threatening information hazard. Eventually, the original post was deleted and any conversation regarding the subject was prevented. Many try to justify this decision as preventing the existence of this positive singularity because from the moment that Roko thought about it, the concept had already been created, dooming hundreds, even thousands of people who saw this post. I personally don't think that's the case though. Last Wrong's creator, Eliezer Yudkowsky, said that the original post was deleted because of its disturbing nature that could potentially trigger panic attacks on sensitive people. But you know how it goes. Once on the internet, forever on the internet. It continued to grow as a concept, and multiple horror blogs and YouTube channels started to talk about this thought experiment. Soon enough, they attributed the concept to a basilisk, a mythological creature that could kill you only by looking at it pretty similar to the nature of the single ton. They call it Roko's Basilisk, and it spread like wildfire on the internet. I wrote this last few paragraphs back in early December 2021, and that was pretty much all I had to it. Sure, I could talk about why you shouldn't be afraid of the Roko's Basilisk and why it is totally unlikely to actually happen, but it just didn't feel right to me. I had to add something to make the whole concept interesting. Otherwise, it would just be nonsense nerd stuff to most watchers. Weird things that take place in real life are so much more interesting 
than those who happen only in our imaginations, though in some cases, the latter can slip through into reality, depending on who's imagining. This is a story about the time I made someone go nearly insane by complete accident. You are watching Akator Z, and this is why you shouldn't trust the Rokos Basilisk. Back when I first heard about this whole story, I started telling my friends. I didn't do my research, instead I was telling them a distorted and a little bit exaggerated version of the story, but it followed basically the same principle as the original thing. I started to ask for people's opinions at school. It was close to our summer break, so we just spent most of the day chatting, because finals were already over and the teachers didn't bother actually teaching and instead decided to chat along with the students. I first told a couple of guys in my class who were like, aspiring philosophers. They didn't pay much attention. I kept telling people though, and one of them in particular was kinda unsure about the whole concept. After insisting a bit, I decided to leave it be, so I went home at the end of the day. It's the same guy. Multiple messages at once. Seems urgent. Let's see what's going on. Holy sh**, what the f have I done? I tried comforting him as I could. Not knowing enough about the subject, I told him that there was really nothing to worry about. It was just something to make you think. Later, he told me he searched about it online and realized it was pretty dumb and unlikely to happen, so I thought it was over there. That was weird, I thought. So I moved on with my life as usual. And I had a great idea for the first time in months, doing a video about the Roku's Basilisk. I thought that maybe I could include that guy's reaction in the video and the concept was looking cool in my mind. I started researching like a maniac and wrote the first part of this video in less than two hours. And then depression kicked in. I didn't know what to do with it, so I kept procrastinating to distract myself. On the following days I was thinking, man, I should finish the script. At the end of the day, I was playing Tetris. It's from my school's counselor. The next day, I woke up at 5. The school bus arrived at the front of my house. I sat in silence through the whole trip, thinking about what could it be that is so important that the counselor needs to talk to me in person. I was already imagining, and my best guess was, I failed the year. The reason why she had to talk to me was, I have Asperger's Syndrome, which is basically Autism Trial Edition. Sometimes I have trouble keeping track of my grades, so meeting up with the counselor wasn't exactly uncommon. I wasn't mad or anxious at all. Most of the year was composed of online classes, I hadn't really learned much, it wouldn't be that bad for my education. When I arrived, the teacher made the usual roll call, and then left us alone to do whatever. I asked him to go outside because I needed to meet the counselor. He let me go. Walking down the stairs, I see the principal, going in my direction. He has a slightly angry face. Cater? Yes, sir. The counselor needs to talk to you. I will take it there. Come on. I nodded my head, thinking, the principal is involved, I am in trouble. But I had no idea why. As we were walking across the campus towards the principal's office on the other side of the school, he looks at me dead in the eyes and says, All right, Cater, so why don't you tell me more about the Rokos Basilisk or whatever? That <laughs> results and told the school making it sound like some sort of crime, I think. Then he told me to enter the office and talk to the counselor who was waiting for me. I sit in the chair, shaking. I was very lucky that they all understood it wasn't anything threatening, it was just a thought game to exemplify something that wasn't remotely violent or scary at all. They let me go with a warning. I sigh in relief and go meet my friends. Hey Cater, 
Did you enter some sort of illegal site? Are you Damn, playing fighters games entering with the another deep web? Student? <laughs> Don't Cater, you buy you any guns and make a mass shooting? Hey, are you a curator of the Blue Whale game? Alright, I'm getting really worried. What the f*** is going on right now? I took it as a joke when the first guy asked me if I was committing crimes online. I had skipped several school days without warning anyways. But when those questions started coming up in mass, I started to get really worried. Last day, my classmates were just arriving at the classroom when the principal stormed in with his phone showing a picture of my face and he asked if I belonged to this class. Everyone confirmed and he explained that, quote unquote, I was playing psychological games with another student and sharing disturbing content probably taken from illegal internet sites. Everyone was in awe and someone asked if this game was like the blue whale. The principal confirmed, yeah, yeah, like the blue whale game. For those of you who don't know, the Blue Whale game is an internet challenge on which people are forced by other people named creators to complete 50 tasks that involve, but are not limited to, public shaming, destruction of property, vandalism, and usually ends with It's not a fun thing to be mistaken for a curator. And that's basically what happened to me. Everyone was asking me about it, some of them even seemingly scared of me and having to explain the whole concept over and over and over and over and over again for more than 10 people, one at a time. It wasn't nice at all. At a certain point, I started spamming that friend's DMs. I'll call him electronic, just to make it easier. He read the messages around four hours after I left the meeting, and to my surprise, he denied everything. Everything. He said the only time he was scared by the Roku's Vazidis was when he searched online first and saw the first few sites not receiving any safe information. He said he didn't contact school or told anyone openly that he was panicking over it. So how in the world had the principal found out? I knew it had to be him, because the counselor gave me his name. Why was he so freaked out anyways? The rabbit hole goes really, really deep. And today, I want you to come with me. It's February. You know what that means. School is starting. You know what that means. Time to cut my hair short. Yeah, that's right. We're kind of legally obligated to cut our hairs at our school. All of the boys have to do the military cut and stay that way through the entire year. This seems really terrible, which it is, but it's just something that you get used to. Over time, you will learn to love yourself in a different way, even though most of your confidence comes from your hair, because your head looks weird and no hat fits in you right. It's not bad at all. Okay, enough of joking around. This video is taking a lot of time to make because of personal problems, so it would mean the world if you could subscribe to make my day just a little better. I love to write, I love to post what I write for lots of people to see. Thank you so much for watching. All right, back to the basilisk. It had been nearly a month since everything happened, and I was happily on vacation. It was December 29th, I was at house. We were watching Rhapsody Street Kids Believe in Santa, a terrible Christmas movie, <laughs> but it's fun to watch terrible movies with close friends. I was sleeping over because the following day, the two of us and one more friend were going on a trip to an amusement park, so you could tell we were looking forward to it. It was electronic. I immediately prepared for the worst. As it turned out, he truly went insane. Even knowing the Roko's Basilisk wasn't real, he was deeply scared and paranoid, even to the point of taking pills to calm himself down. He wanted some words of comfort, to tell him once and for all, it was all fake. Of course, I cut it out and told him the truth, about the outright burden, about the solutions, about the examples about less wrong, hell, even about the quantum billionaire trick, another example featured on the original post. He tried to rationalize all of this and thank me quickly. I could tell he hadn't understood perfectly though. He hung up. I was in shock. I didn't want to be involved in a literal mental breakdown of someone else. I almost panicked, telling myself it was all going to go right on its own. And I just had to confirm to Electronic that the whole story was fake. Damn bro, as if I was a shining light of absolute truth. The following days, even after New Year, were nothing short of annoying 
He kept spamming my DMs with messages like, are you sure this is fake? And some things like that. I was starting to get mad at him, so when the messages stopped, I started to ignore. And it worked. I talked to him a couple of days ago about school and he told me he had overcome his fears about the Roko's Basilisk. He even consented to appear in this video on the condition that I didn't show any names or specific details about what happened. Yeah, that wasn't even the whole story. I had to cut some things out for privacy. You know what else doesn't tell the whole story? Alright, so the first thing we're gonna do in here is read an article about the Roku's Basilisk on a Brazilian horror blog called Zero Corpse. Just a disclaimer, I don't have anything against the blog or the people involved in writing this post. It's not the first result that appears on Google either, the first one being actually an informative blog with a little bit more responsibility on the way the information was addressed. And also, this is most likely the forum that Electronic saw first. I can guess that because my counselor actually assembled a physical document with multiple texts and I remember the first sentence was his name means little king which is on zero corpse again no hate on the site just criticizing the way the information was addressed for the sake of information we're searching for blogs in Portuguese that being our native language so it's all gonna be roughly translated all right here we go <coughs> heads up the contents of the following text may, if proven correct, cause you eternal torment. The fact that you know what Roko's Basilisk is could put you at risk. You have been warned. For starters, what is a basilisk? The basilisk is a mystical creature, originating from Greece, being represented as a giant serpent. In some descriptions, such as in European bestiaries and classical legends, the basilisk is considered a fantastic serpent although it has been depicted in other forms. His name means Little King. Leonardo da Vinci wrote that the basilisk is so cruel that when it cannot kill animals with its poisonous vision, it turns to plants and herbs and fixing its gaze on them dries them up. The poet Percy Bysshe Shelley also alluded to the deadly gaze of the basilisk in his Ode to Naples. Quote unquote, Be thou like the imperial basilisk, killing thy foe, with unapparent wounds. The basilisk symbolizes the figure of death, the devil, sin, or the antichrist. Among the deadly sins to which the basilisk is often compared are greed, but also envy and arrogance. Depictions of the basilisk are frequent inside the church from the 13th to the 17th century and are often found in baptismal fonts, vestibules, shrines, etc. Rocco is an user of the last wrong blog a place used to discuss philosophy, psychology, artificial intelligence, among other subjects. In 2012, Rocco posted a philosophical exercise that upset several blog users and as a consequence ended up having the post deleted. The exercise in question was called the Rocco's Basilisk. Rocco proposed the following. At some point, we will reach the technological singularity, a point in human history where technology and artificial intelligence will have overtaken humans, allowing subsequent technological advances to occur faster and on a larger scale. Despite seeming something beneficial, according to several scholars, an artificial intelligence superior to man in all areas would not have the reason to be submissive to us, threatening the X risk, the risk of the extinction of the human race. Under these conditions, to prevent a possible rebellion, we will build an omnipotent, super artificial intelligence that will secure our species. This super artificial intelligence will be built for the good of humanity having to be created as soon as possible. So to speed up this process, it will eternally punish all of those who delayed its creation. And that the Stokin future, the recreation of human consciousness will be perfectly possible. As such, the basilisk would recreate the consciousness of all of those who delayed its creation in an individual virtual reality for each one where it will grant them time. Time for you to become you. Time for you to go through all the experiences that constitute the being you know so well and, in the end, it will punish you eternally for having delayed their creation. Or has this already happened? The worst part is that maybe everything we are living is a simulated reality, so that, in the end, we are punished by the basilisk. After all, 
What are the five senses but electrical impulses? Who can guarantee that our lives are not an announcement of eternal punishment? Basilisk uses what we called retrocausality. The effect comes before the cause. To secure your good, the basilisk will threaten you with eternal suffering, so that you will endeavor to have it created as soon as possible and do you infinite good. A blackmail. So shouldn't we prevent its creation as much as possible? Or would it be inevitable? Rocco's basilisk resembles another very interesting and controversial thought experiment, where Pascal, a French philosopher and mathematician, comes to the conclusion that, in the case of the existence of God, the best bet is to believe. If God exists and you believe, you have infinite gain. If God exists and I don't believe, I have infinite loss. If God doesn't exist and I believe, you have finite loss. And if God doesn't exist and I don't believe, I have finite gain. However, the argument is not as solid as it appears. The bet rules out other gods, hells, heavens, purgatories, sins. It just shows that it will be a reasonable decision to believe in God since he is omniscient. In other words, the bet becomes obsolete given that it will not be a voluntary faith. Let's say that the risks of something like this happening are low, despite existing. You can sleep peacefully for now. Let's repeat that last bit. Let's say that the risks of something like this happening are low. Right off the bat, this is why you shouldn't be scared. It is completely, absolutely unlikely to be created, especially since the technology nowadays is walking on a path no one could imagine. Of course, intelligent robots still exist, but everyone is talking about crypto coins, the blockchain, metaverse, and the goddamn JPEG monkeys that are turning random people into millionaires every passing day. In my opinion, this kind of rules out the possibility of a singularity quite a bit. Let's say that the risks of something like this happening are low, despite existing. Second of all, this post is full of misinformation. I know, I know, it's a horror blog. It's not made to be informative. But what to do when you get scared and think it's real? You have to do your research. And what to do when the first results in Google are loaded with badly addressed information? First error. In 2012, Roko posted a philosophical exercise that upset several blog users. The post where Roko mentions the content for the first time was made in July 2010. It's two years off! Second error, the most obvious one. I have read the original post more than five times throughout the making of this video, and not in a single sentence does it mention eternal suffering, eternal torture, eternal punishment, etc. The only mention of everlasting pain or something similar are on the comment section. Roko says that the singleton wants to punish you, not necessarily punish you eternally. The idea of punishment is relative. It's not 100% related to pain or torture. Don't believe in the internet. Do your research. We can't end up like my friend. He passed more than a month losing his mind over something so obviously hypothetical. Nowadays, information is more accessible than ever, and even if you have to dig for your original post to find the truth, that's what I want to do when I find something so absurd that a lot of people are scared of. Thank you for following along. This is Skater Z. Until next time.